My name is um, Princeton Farrow, and uh, I'm uh, one of the developers of the Vol language server, and I'm a contributor to the Vol project. And uh, this is my talk on how to improve app development in Vala. So I'm going to talk about the uh, language server I've been working on. Uh, then I'm going to sort of talk about more general topics about how to improve Vala as an ecosystem. Um, so when we think about uh, Vala, when you think about any language as an ecosystem, uh, that language has tools. And when we start off without any tools for a language or with very few tools for a language, um, one of the first big steps we can take uh, to improving the developer experience is to have a language server. And language servers are very important because they allow you to, they allow developers to uh, look at how their code is changing in real time and to analyze it in real time. And doing this allows you to iterate much faster than you normally would. And when you iterate faster, you develop higher quality apps. So before we had a language server, you had a variety of choices and none of these were very, was very good. Um, the problem with them is that the, uh, their uh, functionality was uh, not consistent and they, developed, they depended heavily on the capabilities of the editor. And so if you wanted Vala to be supported in one of your editors, you had to write a plugin for it. And this meant that there had to be a lot of duplication of effort to get Vala supports in the editor. So along came this thing called the language server protocol, which basically allows you to write one language server for n editors. The protocol allows you to, allows an editor to say what features it supports and a language server to say what features it supports it's very modular. So an editor does not have to support everything in order to work with a language server and vice versa. So when we look at the architecture of uh, the language server, um, that the Vol language server, um, there's basically a number of components. We have a documentation engine. We have the protocol layer. Um, we have the project manager which I'll talk a bit more about. And then we have various language providers, which are for the various things you want in a language server, like code completion, outlining, signature help, symbol search, refactoring operations, and so on. And then all of this stuff is built on top of the Vala compiler. So initially we had some problems, which with the compiler itself, one of the, one of the big problems affecting usability was memory leaks. So the compiler was not designed to uh, be uh, a part of a long running process like a language server. And so there were a lot of memory leaks and we plugged a lot of them. I think we plugged all of them basically. And by doing that, we um, reduced memory consumption of the language server from a few gigabytes to a few hundred megabytes on average, most projects. Um, also, the, the compiler would, would just totally stop if it encountered syntax errors. And it didn't proceed to semantic analysis. And so that meant that you know, as you're typing something, you, you want to have the compiler continue to analyze the symbols in your document so that you can get completions, even if you're typing something that is not semantically valid. So we had to um, address that with a series of patches to the compiler, uh, to the parser more specifically. Um, so the next challenge is we want user interaction to be fast. So when you're typing, we want you to you type something like a dot, we want you to get completion instantly. And uh, there's two th things that we do here. Um, because uh, because um, uh, code context updates, recompilations are uh, happening on the main thread, uh, we have a possibility of, we have the problem of, of main thread blocking all um, interaction while, while you're compiling. So we want to make sure that we're delaying the context updates as much as possible until after the user is done typing, rather than trying to do it in every single key press. Um, and 
then also we have this parser we wrote on top of it, on top of the existing parser, which uh, runs from your cursor backwards to the end of the expression. And um, it's lightning fast. And because it doesn't have to obviously parse the entire document or to parse the entire um, project. And so using that allows you to get very fast completion for 90% for of the cases where you're writing some sort of simple expression that can be parsed very easily. Um, now we also want to think about uh, project management. Now, um, some language servers don't do a lot of project management and they leave it to the editor to do the project management. Then the editor is supposed to send information about the project um, to the language server and the language server is supposed to be agnostic about what the project is. And uh, the problem with this approach is that you have to implement project management in the editor. So that means that if you wanted to have, um, if you wanted to support Vala in this case, you'd have to implement uh, project management like for the Mesa and build system in every editor you want. And so you run into that same similar problem with, with having to do things across an editor. So instead what we do is we take the idea we say we take the idea that the server should implement as much about the build system as possible. And in Vala, we have very good integration with Mason. And we can do this because Mason has a very friendly introspection API. Um, Vala is a first class citizen in Mason. And also most Vala project most Vala projects use um, Mason anyway. So we're covering a lot of ground just by supporting Mason. I looked at auto tools and I don't think it's worth supporting because it's not used by many projects now and it's also too complex. It doesn't have an introspection API. Um, CMake uh, is a possibility. There's a few notable large projects that use CMake, but um, they, uh, but Vala is not a first class citizen in CMake and they use, they get Vala support by having these macros that they bundle with their project with their build system. And uh, the problem with those macros is that they don't allow the, they don't produce introspection data that, that allows us to look at the compiler arguments for, for the project, for example. So if we wanted to fix that, we would have to first write the CMake, set of CMake macros, and then uh, send pull requests to all the, to the existing projects that use CMake and Vala and get them to use it. And then we could think about CMake support. But um, so there's some ideas and discussion about it, but I don't think it's worth thinking about right now too much. Um, then we have more basic things. Navigation, obviously you can go, you can search references. You can, you can um, search for all symbols in your documents. You can go to implementation, go to hidden methods, that sort of thing. And we have so far very basic code refactoring capabilities, you can just rename a symbol and it works, but that's what you have so far. Um, when it comes to documentation, the way how that works is, um, well, most, most libraries, most GLib-based libraries are installed with uh, a large file called a geobject introspection file. And it's used by geobject introspection to create bindings for um, for other languages. Um, but a lot of times these files contain, it's like a big API file and the, the description of the API. And it contains a lot of times um, the code comments and documentation for it, which is usually written in the GTK doc format, which is what's used for um, like, if you ever use diff help and you look at the docs there, it's the same thing. Um, so we just parse that and that's how we show you documentation. Um, the docs are usually written for the C version of the language of the API. So um, we, an additional step, it, it would look very weird to you to have to look at the C API and sort of translate that mentally in your mind. So we just do something extra where we sort of convert all of that stuff to what it would look like in Vala. And so this gives you documentation. It looks more like Vala documentation, even though it's generated from C documentation. Um, so, so you think about what you so so you think about um what editors you can you can do this in today as opposed to like a while ago. We actually have a lot of editor support now, and 
some of this comes from plugins and some of this comes from built-in support on the, on the side of the editor. So with Visual Studio Code, you have a valid plugin you maintain. It's very good. Um, you should use that. Uh, Gnome Builder, we also have a plugin bundled with uh, VLS. So if you install VLS, you get Gnome Builder support. Um, Vim, if you install... Uh, you can you can set up Vala support like this. You install um, Conquer of Completion. Uh, you add this snippet to your config, and uh, you're good to go. Um, you can al also NeoVim has a, another plugin called uh, LSP Config, where the developers of that have have implemented Vala support. So if you install that, there's no config. You just get it. Um, Kate's recent merge requests added support for Vala language server. So um, that's built in now. Emacs, you can just install LSP mode and that, the, that, pro, that uh, plugin also has built in Vala support. Sublime so text, you can install these in two, pack, two packages and add this to your config and um, you're good to go. So it's very easy to start using Vala in all sorts of editors compared to the way things were a while ago. So what are my future plans for Vala Language Server? Well, there's a lot of future plans we could have because there's a lot to do. Uh, one of the things I want to tackle is responsiveness. Um, if you try using VLS with very large projects like Geary, for example, which is like 30,000 lines, I think, um, you run into problems that like it's slow, right? And there's two ways we can think about solving this. One of them is it's, it's slow because like I said earlier, um, uh, we're doing compilation on the main thread because the compiler library was not it's not designed to do multi-threaded compilation. So we're blocking all of the requests to the language server while we're compiling it, compiling your project. Um, so there's two ways to address this. One is to say threaded comp compilation. We're going to have a separate worker thread, and we're going to create a new code context and just do comp compilation there. Once we're done. We switch it with the old one and we destroy the old one. The problem with that is that it requires you to duplicate memory a lot. And so um, that can, you know, when you have like 100 megabytes for your project, um, that's okay. But if if you look at a project like Geary or even the Vala compiler itself, uh, that's the code context for that is like a gigabyte. So duplicating that is not ideal in memory. Um, so the other thing we can do is, well, we can observe that, you know, when you update the, when you update a file, you're not really changing much of the whole um, project. In fact, you're changing a very small part of it. So there's a lot of code nodes that would be the exact same once you're finished recompiling. So um, implementing incremental recompilation uh, is a, is an approach and I'm leaning, and I'm leaning towards that because of course, problems where like, okay, you, let's say you're refactoring a symbol that's used everywhere, then you can't get around that. So you're going to have to recompile everything. So it's going to be slow in that case. Um, but I think that's not going to, that's going to be more of the exception than the rule. Um, obviously code refactoring, it's very basic. Like I said, we just have renaming support. So there's other things that I have on my radar. Um, a lot of these things are very common in editors like VS Code and uh, IntelliJ IDEA. So um, you know, organizing imports, inlining, changing the signature of a method, deleting method, stuff like that. Um, completion is a very case by case thing. So there's just a whole bunch of cases that I'm not going to go into. Um, there's a link below with a milestone for a lot of the different cases. Um, in general, we want, uh, code suggestions to be context sensitive, meaning that we, we don't just want to show you all of the symbols you can see, that the compiler can see, but rather we want to show you symbols that are only relevant for what you're trying to do. So for example, if you're um, creating an object, like you're doing new something, right? We wanna show you namespaces that contain types and types, and these types are um, types that have constructors or they're types that you can instantiate or um, otherwise something that can be used in that expression, right? We don't just want to show you like constants, for example, that not, doesn't make sense. Um, and working with that configuration means we want to just do the right thing without having to have a preferences or anything like that. So here's an example of that. So for example, we want to have 
smart method completion, right? So uh, most projects have a coding style that looks like the first thing, right? But there's a few projects that have a coding style that looks like this thing, the second thing. And for example, Geary has that. Um, so rather than having like a configuration option that says, you know, complete a method with one space or zero spaces before the uh, uh, arguments list, we want to, you know, linters are already capable of just looking at the whole style of the code and figuring stuff out. So we want to basically run a style analyzer and then just know this, know how to do the right thing without any config, complete it to the way your, um, your coding style would, uh, the way that agrees with your coding style. Um, also, we want like global method, global completion. So that means like if you're trying to complete a symbol. It's not, you have an imported namespace though. So it should just be able to import the namespace for you. That's not really too complicated. Um, so now I'm going to talk more about like how to improve Vala in general um, as an ecosystem. So when we look at the ecosystem like a year and a half ago, you didn't really have much, I think, um, without trying to um, uh, say too much, I think that this, the addition of this language server has improved things. Um, but I think there's still a lot of room for improvement in the infrastructure. And so, um, so let's think about some things we can improve. So one thing is, so tooling, more tools, more types of tools I'm gonna talk about. And then there's also like how we can improve the website, the documentation, and then community spaces. So one really useful tool that other languages have is a static analyzer. And what a static, static analyzer does is it performs a very deep analysis on your code. Um, and uh, it tends to show you things that a compiler would not normally show you. So um, it tends to show you things like, you know, null pointer access or use after free or, you know, something like that, right? And the, it shows you something that it thinks might happen, but it cannot necessarily prove will happen. And uh, that's okay because even if it shows you some false positives, it's still sort of hinting you as to areas in your code where um, there's behavior that might potentially lead to something wrong. Um, and one, one thing that, that Vala would benefit from with static analysis is reference cycle detection. Um, that's something I think that can be a pitfall for a lot of Vala developers um, having leaks in their programs. So for example, static analysis could look at this example of a, a recursive data structure, uh, a list. And in this add method here, we have a um, assignment to uh, prev and also an assignment to next for the um, current object. So this current object creates a strong reference to the next object and the next object creates a strong back reference to the current object. A static analyzer could look at that and it knows that since list is a recursive data type, we're creating a cycle here. And it can just say, you know, you have to change one of these um, fields to weak, weak reference. Another thing that can trip people up, in fact, trip me up, is that um, closures can take strong references to the objects that they uh, were created in. So in this example, this class here will never be garbage collected because the closure for the tree set uh, grabs a strong reference. And so a static analyzer could very easily tell you that this is something that you have to fix. And you know, this would be the fix, for example, you have a method that returns a new closure with a weak reference to the, um, to the object. Uh, we also want to think about how, how we can do linting and formatting better. So linters, as opposed to formatters, generally they're more involved. They, they suggest fixes to code structure and semantics. And they're there to sort of catch unintended behavior, not so much style, right? Not, not just style. So like formatters are just basically code prettifiers. They tell you about style, um, but linters tell you about actual behavior. And so Vala has this nice uh, tool called Vala Lint. It's very nice, but it's mostly just a code prettifier. So it's like Rust format, for example. But we also, I think, should have something like Clippy, which is the linter for Rust. So here's an example of how Clippy works. Um, we have this Rust code here, and uh, we're comparing um, two floating point uh, values. 
for equality, which is a problem. So we run Clippy on this, and first it tells us the error. Then it gives us a suggestion for an alternative. Um, and it says, you know, oh, we have to subtract the two things, get the absolute value, compare it to the error margin. Then it says, oh, you can use these constants for the error margin. And then it says, uh, if you still want more information, you can go to this link. So something like that would be very useful for valid developers. Um, templates. So templates are very important. They allow developers to just get straight from, from nothing to, to writing code, skip past all the writing of build scripts and configuration and stuff like that. And in C-sharp, um, there's an official tool called .NET New. And so you say .NET New named my project. Let's say you want to create a console application or a server application. You say console or a new server, whatever. And uh, it just create it just sets up the project for you. So, um, and these templates come from, a, from the community as well. Um, and other languages have similar tools like this. So I think Vala should have something like this. And along these lines, I introduced Aldo uh, with, with this idea. And um, uh, so far we just have uh, three, three templates, but um, I actually got one pull request yesterday for a new template. And um, I think this would be good if it took off. And um, if anyone has ideas for, for templates, they should uh, submit a pull request. I think it would be um, very good if people were to send in their ideas for more templates. Um, then also, I think we should think about dependency management. So if we look at how other languages manage dependencies, um, like we look at Rust, J JavaScript, Go, C Sharp, with, the, with that, you have dependencies that are per project, and they're either linked in statically to your um, app, or they're bundled in. Um, and with Vala, you don't have that. With Vala, the dependencies are system-wide. You can't, um, they're dynamically linked in. You can't say, you know, I want to have this version of this dependency and, uh, and it, it can be something different from another dependency that, from, from, another, from what another project uses on the same system. So I don't have any sort of proposals too much about this. Um, uh, you could, I mean, M Mason, for example, has the wrap system, which allows you to sort of specify a link to a repository to compile for a dependency. Um, but that's kind of a bit clunky. I, I think something we, sh we could have, we could have a tool that sort of like has this sort of baked in that's kind of language uh, uh, depend that, that sort of um, works with the language more. So, um, but I'm just throwing this out here as an idea. Like I don't have a, a proposal for it. So something to think about. Um, the website, you look at the Vala website, uh, it's not very friendly to newcomers. It has a lot of, um, you know, a lot of text, uh, not anything that quickly gets you to examples or tutorials. You have to scroll all the way bottom. It doesn't really, advertise the language very well, in my opinion. Um, uh, there's work on a new website in, at a new domain. It's very preliminary, but um, we want to sort of redesign things that, so it's more streamlined. And um, we want to have like a learning page and uh, something that can be very uh, attractive to newcomers with no experience to the language. Um, we think about I think we should also think about documentation as well. Volduck is very, very good, but it's also mostly just an API browser with code snippets. Um, there are many existing tutorials out there and some of them are pretty good. And I think um, if we're thinking more, if we're rethinking documentation a bit, we can think about how to centralize these things, sort of like how on other projects, like for example, Rust has like a central area where you can say, you know, I want to read I want to read a tutorial about how to use the language. I want to read about best practices, or I want to read about the API, right? Like having all of that in one location is, um, or, or even like a playground as well as like a fourth option. Like having all that in one location is very, like in a learning center is, is very um, helpful for developers. Um, lastly, uh, the community having, having better community spaces. Uh, so there's IRC, that's very good. There's also the elementary Slack. Recently, a Discord was created. 
um, it's just another thing that, you know, some people like to use Discord as opposed to other spaces. So just creating more spaces that people are interested in using um, uh, is a good thing, I think, for developers. And uh, it's become quite popular. We have close to 100 users now. Um, I encourage more people to join. Um, also, a Twitter account was created to promote the language. Um, you should consider following it, perhaps. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's pretty much my talk. Thanks for listening. Um, if you want to, uh, I'm, I'm Prince781 on IRC and, and on most other spaces. You can contact me for more information. Um, uh, yeah, and thanks thanks for listening to my talk. And now, up next is a live Q&A with Princeton and Elementary co-founder Cassidy Blady. <laughs> Sorry, Cassidy, I tried. Go ahead, guys, you're up. Hi, thanks so much for your talk, Princeton. Um, yeah. Just a few questions here from the chat. Um, and a reminder to everybody watching, if you have any more questions uh, about improving app development in Vala, please drop them in the chat now so we can see them. Um, so one question I had, I know a lot, and a couple of people mentioned it in the chat. Um, Vala developers have been looking forward to language server integration in elementary code, uh, our code editor in elementary OS for some time. Uh, and as far as you know, what are the next steps that could lead to that becoming a reality? Yeah, so um, uh, most importantly, uh, code needs to have an implementation of the language server protocol, uh, which it does not have right now. And so that requires writing a backend for the language server protocol. And then also on top of that, um, uh, the visual changes, there are some visual changes that are needed to accommodate features like um, like showing call hierarchy or showing um, uh, completion for, uh, for method calls and so on. Um, so basically those two things uh, are, are quite needed. Gotcha. Yeah, and I know there's been some progress there on uh, elementary code. Uh, for those interested, following along at home, you can check out github.com slash elementary slash code and uh, check out the issues and pull requests there for the progress. Um, Carlos mentioned uh, for, for them, autocomplete is one of the most helpful features in a programming language tool. Uh, is there a plan for an IntelliJ IDEA plugin? So IntelliJ actually has um, language server protocol support, uh, but I think it's, uh, I don't think it's built in. There's a well-used, there's a, um, a popular plugin for it though. And I actually was able to get a uh, Vala language server working in it. However, there also has to be a plugin made for, um, uh, for syntax highlighting and also for supporting some of the um, uh, commands that, uh, that the server supports. So um, that's what is uh, remaining. Gotcha, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting seeing um, all the different code editors people love to use on elementary OS to write Vala apps. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Um, yeah. Brian asked, is there a Mason LSP server? So to the best of my knowledge, there isn't one, but that's actually a very good idea. And uh, I thought about even uh, writing one myself, but uh, maybe I'll do that if I'm, when I'm not working on these things right now. Yeah, yeah there's always so much to do. <laughs> um, Varun Singh mentioned um, that as a newcomer, they were a little intimidated by uh, how to get started. If they would love to learn Vala, where would you suggest they start? Um, so, uh, Alessandro has a good uh, tutorial set. He was the one who just did a talk about Akira. Um, that's a good place to start. Um, I also think uh, that hanging out around the uh, some of the community spaces like IRC and Discord, uh, you can ask questions and learn a lot, as well as the um, there's also a, red, a subreddit, a Vala subreddit, to ask for help. Um, and there's also some code examples on some of the links that I posted um, in in the in my last slide or second to last slide um, had some good code examples I think so there's yeah. a lot of resources yeah and I mean especially if you're looking at developing on elementary OS as well as um, elementary developer.elementary.io yeah. is is we have our getting started guide linked from there um, as somebody who in the past had never written a line of Vala. Uh, that was instrumental in, in getting me able to write and uh, distribute apps on elementary OS. So I highly recommend that. Um, 
as well. And just the fact that there's so many Vala apps, there's hundreds and hundreds of Vala apps open source out there. Um, that can be another way to get involved is just take a look at an app that's written in Vala that you're interested in and see how things are built under the hood. Um, maybe try your hand at contributing to an existing app. Um, it's a little less intimidating than writing a whole app from scratch sometimes. Yeah. Um, let's see, checking for any more questions. Um, it looks like that may be it for now. Um, thank you again so much for your, for your great talk and um, thanks for joining us here at EDW. Sure. Thank you.